Good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to the East Africa Law Society webinar on performance rights and um, and WIPO performance from performances and phonograms treaty. Um, today, we are very excited. We will explore in our session the legal framework protecting the rights of performers and producers and the importance of the WIPO treaty in protecting these rights. Um, as a performer, um, performers have rights to protect their lives, um, their live and recorded performances from unauthorized recordings or broadcasts and from other unauthorized dealings. So, these rights protect various types of performers, um, such as actors, singers, musicians, dancers, and circus artists. However, complementary artists like extras or technical support sometimes, or the crew do not have rights on their services. Um, the WIPO um, Performances and Phonograms Treaty, which is also called the WPPT, was signed by the Member States of the World Intellectual Property Organization, or WIPO, and aimed to protect the rights uh, of performers and producers of phonograms in a uniform and rather effective manner. So what it does, it, it grants performers economic rights in their performances, uh, fixed phonograms such as the right of reproduction, distribution, rental um, and making available. So today our distinguished speakers will provide an overview of the WIPO Treaty and the legal framework for protecting performers and producers in their respective countries. We've gathered a panel of experts. Um, I would confidently say they're experts from around East Africa. We have brilliant uh, brains and I would say we have a fantastic lineup um, of speakers who will share their insights on this uh, topic. So please join me in welcoming our speakers who will shed light on um, more on these subjects. And um, I will just read out the files of our speakers so that we get to know them better. So first we have Ms. Julia Shui, who is a principal consultant at JGIP. Uh, she's also a lawyer, a singer and an actress. She's featured in many local films. Um, she's well known in Kenya and uh, also I would like to think around East Africa. She's been a TV and radio shows uh, presenter, notably the Franco Fan program on NTV and Kazini Kazi alongside Singawa who on Kameme FM. So as a practicing lawyer, uh, who better to bring to the panel than uh, June Dashway? She has a wealth of experience in intellectual property protection and how music as a business works for her. And we will be uh, looking forward to her insights. Um, next, we have uh, Dr. Anthony Kakuza. Uh, Dr. Anthony Kakuza has featured previously in our, um, in, in, in previous webinars for, um, in this um, intellectual property, for the Intellectual Property Committee of ELS. Dr. Kakuza is an advocate and an academician. He holds a Bachelor of Laws degrees from Makerere University and a Master of Laws degree from Warwick and a doctorate degree from the University of Illinois in the US. Uh, Dr. Kakuza is, um, uh, practices in Uganda and uh, he's, he undertakes IP consultancies for Uganda Registration Services uh, Bureau, the Africa Regional Intellectual Property Organization, (ARIPO), and the World Intellectual Property Organization, WIPO. So he's currently the chair of WIPO's ad hoc expert group on traditional knowledge and traditional cultural expression. Doctor, that is a very shortened bio of Dr. Kakuza. His uh, bio is long and his CV is long. He's well known in the industry. Um, apart from that, we have Mr. Pius uh, Nkunda from um, Rwanda, who is also a very active member of the Intellectual uh, Law Property um, committee at ELS. So Pierce is the managing partner of CM Advocates in Rwanda. He's a corporate and commercial uh, practitioner and um, CM Advocates has offices in Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania and Nigeria. He holds a Bachelor of Law degree from the University of Rwanda and a postgraduate diploma in legal practice. He Practice, his practice focuses on banking, finance, IP, and technology. 
Skills is an advocate in Rwanda and a member of VLS, where he sits in the, I say, the IP committee. So welcome, Pius, and we look forward to hear from you. Our other speaker today is Miss um, Judith Kadege. Uh, Judith yeah, hails from Tanzania, and she's an intellectual property and technology transfer specialist and enthusiast. She has over 15 years experience working as an advisor, trainer, researcher, negotiator with the public sector and its independent affiliations at national and transnational dimensions. Um, Judith has worked for the Copyright Society of Tanzania, um, also known as COSOTA, and later on served as a board member of the society. Currently, she's a research candidate and an employee of the Commission for Science and Technology as IP and TT research coordinator and advisor. Judith is also a practicing lawyer in the United Republic of uh, Tanzania. Welcome, Judith. And uh, with that introduction, you can see how uh, well versed our speakers are for today's subject. So we will just go ahead and um, uh, start off maybe with uh, Ms. June Gashui from Kenya. And uh, today, June will take us through, or rather, will discuss um, the WIPO Performance and Phonograms Treaty and rather introduce the subject, its purpose, and, and how it works, including the obligations that are imposed on them, uh, member states. So over to you, John. Uh, go ahead. Thank you and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I hope that you are having a great afternoon. Catherine, thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, yes, I, I'm really excited to be here as well among my fellow colleagues to discuss something that is very close to my heart uh, because it is the industry that I am playing in, I should say. Uh, as you heard that I am a, a singer songwriter and a performing artist as well. And so with that, I fall squarely in the group of people who are covered by um, these treaties and specifically the WPPT that we will be discussing today. Um, and I think I'll just speak a little bit about the, the industry, the music industry space and the players. So I think just to break it down, I don't want to make any assumptions about who is online and what we know and what we don't know, but just to illustrate it with a simple song. A song begins by um, either having lyrics, somebody writing down some words, or somebody composing the flow of, of a song, the melody. Um, and then that usually would be in a musical sheet um, transcribed, and then now it could be available for performance. And that performance would require instrumentalists, people who play various instruments, pianos, violins, guitars, drums, etc. It would require vocalists and it would require producers. And producers in this particular sense are those who would be in a studio or who would own studios that can bring that piece of paper that had those lyrics and those musical notations to life. And so in the world of music copyright and IP, we separate the people who create the copyright, uh, the copyright rights holders and the owners of that set of rights, the authors, the composers, the publishers and the arrangers. And then we speak about their neighbors those who are in the related rights space or the copyright related rights space. And they are the ones who are the performers and the producers. Now their role is very specific because they're the ones who, and I'm gonna use this terminology in quotes, they are the ones who bring to life the piece of paper that I alluded to earlier. And the way they do that is either by performing it on a stage live or in a studio that would then have another output, which is a recorded piece of music. Now that context I think is important because the WPPT uh, and its sister, the WCT, the WIPO Copyright Treaty and the WIPO uh, Performances and Phonograms Treaties were um, updates of a previous set of treaties, the Berne Convention and the Rome Convention. And that's where I would like to start just to give us a bit of history so we know how we arrived 
at this particular treaty that is the subject of our discussion today. Now, the Rome Convention for the Protection of Performers, Producers of Phonograms and Broadcasting Organizations dates back to 1961. And the idea here was to first establish that there are contributions that are made by the performers and the producers who are part of what we call related rights to the copyright or neighboring rights to the copyright. Now, performers were highlighted earlier in Kathleen's uh, introduction, but these could be actors because the same would apply for people who are in audiovisual work, TV series, um, films, or things that we watch on TVs, singers uh, such as myself, musicians, dancers who you see in music videos, and all of those types of uh, outputs, and those who perform and bring to life literary and artistic works. This gave them the protection against certain acts that they had not yet been consenting to. For example, the broadcasting and the communication to the public of their live performances. Think of how many times we've gone to a venue and seen a band performing as you're having a meal or having a drink with your colleagues. And you may see somebody with their phone or a camera crew from a media house who then records that performance and fixates it or there's now a fixation of that live performance and ultimately then a reproduction of that live performance that we then enjoy then on TV and now in the, with the outset of uh, technology and the digital space, we can even enjoy it on our phones, on social media platforms, on YouTube and other such uh, digital platforms that have now come to existence. The same was true for producers of phonograms. They now were given under the Rome Convention, the right to authorize or to prohibit the direct or indirect reproduction of their phonograms. Now, in this particular uh, convention, they went into detail to try and explain that phonograms are the any exclusively oral, meaning things that you can hear, oral fixation of sounds uh, or any performance of sounds. Now, if this particular phonogram had been published for commercial purposes, then you would then have the potential for what we call secondary uses or secondary abuses. So for example, broadcasting, somebody could take that audio, like I work at a radio station and we play some of these oral fixations and the producers of phonograms were then given the right to say yes or no. So to either authorize or prohibit the broadcasting of these phonograms and the communication to the public or public performance of these phonograms, again, at a restaurant, in public transport, at a bar. And that right was squarely vested with the producers of phonograms. Broadcasting organizations, I will not dwell on too much for the purposes of today's discussion, but they were also included in the scope of the Rome Convention back in 1961. It also then gave rise to limitations and exceptions. As we all know, well, for all lawyers in the room, with every rule, there is always an exception or a limitation to the rights that have been granted. Now, the idea here was to limit and ex uh, give exceptions where private use were concerned. Uh, and private use would be you or I listening to music in our homes when we have guests. And this it's different from a commercial use. So if I was running a restaurant and I decided to use these phonograms and these fixated performances in my restaurant, I could arguably be said to be making commercial benefit from the use of that music if that music and those phonograms are uh, incidental to my or significantly incidental to my business. But in the case of private use, that was seen as an exception and one would then not be required to license or pay to the same extent as they would be if there was commercial use. Um, and so the other item that was the fourth pillar of the Rome Convention was the aspect of the duration. Now, how long was this supposed to last for? At the time, they suggested 20 years. Um, in the case of a phonogram from the time the fixation is made uh, for performances as well. If that performance was captured, then 20 years. But I think we all know that that time, uh, time duration has been uh, expanded to a 50 year term. And in some jurisdictions in the West, even uh, the extension to 70 years has been granted. Now, 
the thing that gave birth to what we call the WIPO internet treaties, given that the Berne Convention existed for artistic and literary works for copyright, and now the Rome Convention existed in 1961 for performers and producers of phonograms, was the internet. And what, that's, what does that mean? It brought to light uh, opportunities and risks. As we always say, the internet is a friend and a foe. It opened up a new market, but it also created opportunities for more infringement. And therefore the WIPO treaties uh, came to be in 1996. And the one we are discussing today specifically is the WIPO Performance and Phonogram Treaty. It's dating back all the way to 1996. Um, and it deals with two kinds of beneficiaries in the digital environment. The ones I've already referred to, the performers, who are actors, singers, musicians, etc., and the producers of phonograms. Now, these could be uh, legal persons. I could be my own uh, phonogram producer if I fund uh, the making of my master recordings or my phonograms, or it could be a legal entity like a record label that's been established. Now, when they take the responsibility and the financial responsibility to put together the fixation of these sounds, and that is where their right is derived from. Now, these rights are addressed in these treaty because of the fact that the rights granted are purely oral. I'll keep reminding us about that because that's very different from an artistic or literary uh, uh, work. But the oral audio performance is the reason why this treaty covers these two groups of people. Now, as far as the performers are concerned, there was an amplification of the rights they were given in the Rome Convention. For starters, it granted them economic rights to the fixation of their performances in these phonograms, specifically oral. Now, it gave them the right of reproduction. It gave them the right of distribution. It gave them a rental right or a rental, right of rental. And it gave them the fourth right, which is the right of making available. I'll quickly describe what those are. It basically gives the performer the right to authorize either a direct or an indirect reproduction of their performance within a phonogram. Secondly, it gives them the right of distribution. It gives them the right to authorize the making available of uh, the original copies and the original and the copies of their performance in a phonogram uh, recording to members of the public through either a sale or a transfer of ownership. The third is a right of rental. And this is the right to authorize the commercial rental to the public again of the original or copies of the phonogram as determined by your particular national law. This method is different in each of our various countries. And the idea is um, the equitable right of remuneration then can be available for such a rental, depending on what your legal provisions in your respective countries say. And finally, the right of making available is the right to authorize the making available to the public by wire or wireless means. I smile every time I say this phrase because this was back in 1996. And I keep thinking how life has changed so much that almost everything we do now, everything we experience, everything we exploit, everything we enjoy is through wire or wireless means. Uh, and any performance of these fixations in a phonogram, uh, the members of the public do not need to be sat at their radio station, uh, radio frequency to listen to the song at that point. If you're uh, subscribing to platforms such as Deezer, Boomplay, Apple Music, you can decide when you want to enjoy this music. And that's the difference between, let's say, a broadcast and a making available right, uh, which allows you to do so on demand. It also allows some element of interactivity when you're now dealing with the making available right on the internet. Now, it also gave the, the performers um, a right to uh, unfixed live performances. I referenced this a little bit earlier when I mentioned being out with your friends and watching the performance of a live band at one of your local restaurants. Now, that particular performance, the right of broadcasting then, and the right of communication to the public and the right of fixation were also granted to performers in this particular treaty, the WPPT. 
the treaty went ahead to also grant moral rights. I think for most of us, if we are aware of the discussions we usually have within the, the, the internet space or the IP space specifically, we talk about economic rights and we talk about moral rights. Now, the moral right is the right to be claimed or even identified as the performer of these uh, uh, phonographic, the, I should say the performances in the phonogram works. And it also gives you an additional right to object to any mutilation, any derogation or any modification that you as a performer believe could be prejudicial to your reputation. That was necessary because in a lot of jurisdictions, you may find that the use of somebody's performance was not as uh, firmly um, protected. And in addition to that, a lot of these performers were not named in the credits. And we've seen a lot of this in, in the Kenyan example where there's beautiful music from the 60s, the 70s, the 80s. And when we ask those producers and those uh, artists, I can hear three or four people in the background singing in your album, in your recording. Who are those? And those performers were rarely named. They probably got a token as they walked into the studio and did their performance and left. But this treaty recognized their contribution and said, you do have that moral right to be um, identified as the performer who did something in this particular phonogram right. And I referenced the economic rights earlier. I think the other thing now that was brought in within the limitations and the exceptions uh, under Article 16 of the WPPT, there was a three-step test that was provided in order to help different uh, contracting parties or member states to determine uh, whether the limitation or exception uh, that was brought forward or was being suggested uh, was in line with Article 9 uh, 2 of the Berne Convention. Um, and basically, the three step test uh, uh, allowed the contracting states to also devise new exceptions and limitations uh, that were appropriate within the digital environment specifically. Um, and also, the extension of any existing. Uh, limitations or exceptions was also granted as long as those uh, uh, tests were met. Um, I want to quickly uh, just go into um, the issue of uh, technological protection measures and I think that is relevant because one of the risks that arose with the onset of the digital environment was uh, risks around how people would consume content on the internet. Now the treaty does oblige contracting parties in accordance with their respective legal systems to ensure that there are enforcement procedures that are available in their laws so as to permit effective action against anyone who infringes uh, any of the rights that are covered in the treaty. This one is arguable in, in some of the, 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 the acts that we have in our region uh, because the enforcement, as we all know, IP is a private right and we'll always have that debate about whether the enforcement should then be something that is uh, the, the mandate of the state um, and look at this as an economic crime, or should it be uh, under the purview of the rights holder themselves, meaning that I then have to go and pursue civil a civil action against the person who is the infringer. Regardless of which case is available, ideally both, if it is possible, there should be an enforcement procedure and uh, uh, provisions that are made available. Now, I reference the double-edged sword element for creators and content owners, because there's the rights that are protected for those who create content, but there's also the right that the public has to consume certain content and other creators have to use your content. Very simple example, somebody could use my song in the making of a film, the sound uh, uh, fixation of my song uh, synchronized to their uh, visuals. Now, what are we talking about when we talk about technological protection measures? Things that allow digital copying not to happen as often. And again, there's a historical context to the language we're using here because of how old these treaties are. Now, 1996, we were mostly analog. So you would have a physical DVD, a physical CD, and the digital copying of that content is what was envisioned. How do you prevent somebody from copying physically your CD or your DVD. There was conversations around the compression of audio or video works 
Um, so if you reduce the amount of uh, resolution, then you will be able to compress and then multiply the number of copies and reproductions that you can have. Obviously, there would have been a, a compromise in terms of the quality of the audio and the quality of the visual. That's one of the ones. And finally, uh, looking at networks and bandwidth as well. These are some of the risks. So technological protection measures were then available um, to ensure that these measures are protected is one of the obligations of a contracting state, as well as the ability to deter the, the measures that these parties may have um, to make sure that the rights of content owners are not violated. So software uh, could be used here, encryption, passwords, and access codes. So that generally brings us to the end of what the WPPT was trying to achieve. Uh, and I hope that the context with the Rome Convention gives you uh, a bit of historical context. In the case of uh, Kenya, now, this particular treaty came into effect in May of 2002. And that just shows you about five years had passed from 1996 to 2002 by the time the treaty, six years, by the time the treaty came into effect. Currently, as of today, there's 112 uh, member states who have uh, uh, signed and ratified the treaty. Kenya has signed the treaty, but Kenya has not yet um, ratified the treaty. I was trying to get this clarification today because I saw some research that said we had signed this treaty and we had ratified it, but we have not deposited the treaty at WIPO yet. And so if you check the WIPO website today, Kenya is only listed as one who has signed the treaty. And finally, I'll reference our Kenyan scenario uh, before I wind up. We have actually put a lot of these provisions into our Copyright Act. Our Copyright Act has been amended from 2001 um, all the way up to 2019. There's been several uh, versions of this uh, Copyright Act that have come to light. We do have in Section 30, the provisions for performance, Section 30 of the Copyright Act. We did have a provision for Section 30A, which was then uh, repealed. And that particular provision was the one for equitable remuneration. Um, and there's been debates even as we have conversations with, for example, the US Trade Office um, about whether that right for producers and that right for performers must be either an exclusive right or an equitable remuneration right. I hope we'll get into that a bit later. For producers, we do have section 28 in our act that provides um, for protection, uh, for rights of distribution, rights of rental as well, and rights of making available in sections 23, 26, and section 30. And all of them have moral rights protected in sections 32. Um, I don't want to take too much more time so that my colleagues can also uh, make some uh, interventions as well, but I'll be back uh, to discuss a little bit more the current, the current uh, situation. Thank you so much, Catherine, over to you. Oh, wow. Thank you for that, June. Um, that was such an insightful introduction. And um, I mean, truly, your words have really set the stage for what promises to be such an engaging and um, enlightening discussion. Um, I mean, as a performer yourself, your passion for the topic really shone through in your introduction. And you really provided us with an excellent overview of performance rights and the WIPO Treaty. And uh, we're all excited to learn more from our other speakers. And it's interesting to learn about Kenya. I mean, I, I didn't know that as well, um, that we haven't deposited it. And, um, but by and large, your expertise and enthusiasm will undoubtedly inspire all of us today. And we're grateful for your contribution. So um, thank you again, June, for setting us off on the right note. Dr. Kakuza, turning to you, could you please examine the you know, the current legal framework in Uganda for protection of performers and producers and um, really take us through the challenges faced by the creative industry in implementing the treaty. Thank you very much, Catherine, and good afternoon to everyone. Um, I hope you can hear me very well. We can. So, so I thank June for setting the ball running and giving us a brief um chronolog of the history of performances and phonograms treaties and discussions i wanted to share my slides but as i get into sharing my slides i want to probably touch base with the ugandan situation and skip 
the international one. So, okay, the current legal framework within Uganda, those are the last three slides which are before you. Looking at Uganda, unlike Kenya, which signed in December of 1996, fast forward, it's only 2022 that Uganda signed and ratified the, the WIPO PPT. So that was January 28th of 2022. We brought it into force in April of last year as well. But interestingly, it's, it has more like a retrospective approach in the sense that when you look back at our 2006 Corporate and Neighboring Rights Act, which was the first of our reformed intellectual property laws, if I would put it that way, because Uganda, having been, of course, a founding member of the, of the World Trade uh, World Trade Organization, and therefore took on the TRIPS agreement in 1995, we started a process of reforming our intellectual property laws. And the first one to go through a successful reform was the Corporate and Neighboring Rights Act in 2006. So we were quick to incorporate quite a number of the principles from the international realm, the Ban Convention of 1886, which uh, June has referred to, um, the, the different patent treaties, as well as everything related to in, industrial designs and, and so on and so forth. So starting with the 2006 legislation, having incorporated many of these principles, it's only in 2022 that we said, okay, let's, decide, let's now look into ratifying the treaties that we had studied and incorporated the principles backwards. So the 2006 legislation, in a way, captures many of the principles that June has referred to, but not fully, not expressly. For instance, because the, the WIPO Performance and Phonograms Treaty is more focused on online content, issues related to technological protection measures, for instance, and, and the rights of producers of phonograms in the digital space, this has not been broadly captured within our 2006 legislation. When you look at section five um, of the Corporate and Neighboring Rights Act, it lays out the works, the, the kind of corporate works that are eligible for protection as copyright. And it simply lists, I think it's somewhere section five, subsection one E, it talks about computer programs and stops at that. So that's more like broad, whereas we, we would normally be looking at more of a specific positioning of how do we bring in digital rights management and how do we bring in technological protection measures that are more specifically alluded to within the WIPO Performance and Phonograms Treaty. But generally, in terms of benefits, I could say that the benefits that we're picking out of ratification, it's just one and a half years since we ratified the, the treaty. But we can say that we are, we're on to a right path. The, the right path being that we now have a general appreciation of material online, as opposed to the brick and mortar style of uh, understanding or appreciating anything that would consider corporate work. So today we've seen that exponential increase in online corporate content. People are more into streaming material, streaming songs, streaming movies, and reading books online as opposed to going to the store and buying a DVD or buying a cassette, if people even know what cassettes are or things of that nature. So because we are more into consuming online material and people are creating content online, we, we even have musicians that, and performers who do collaborations online with other people without necessarily being in the same country and they lay them out. Uh, we've had people that have online music shows without necessarily having the actual one out there. I mean, COVID has taught us so many of these things. So we need to be uh, a country that embraces ways in which we can protect these material performances online. Because if we're utilizing them online without any law into, in place, we'll be open to more of such infringements. So the second other thing that we see in terms of a benefit is that we're looking at giving ourselves as a country that international level of protection that comes with um, the provisions within the treaty. So Bond Convention of 1886 has an element of contracting states having, uh, as long as you are a signatory to the Bond Convention, 
the protection that you have within your country would be offered for your works in another country that is also a signatory to the Bank Convention. So under Article 3 of the WIPO Performance and Phonograms Treaty, it has the same principle that in as long as you're contracting states, your works as a producer of phonograms or a performer would be protected in another contracting state. So we're seeing cross-border protections as a benefit for anyone or any country that ratifies the treaty. And that's something that Uganda is definitely going to embrace. And the other benefit that we can see is the recognition of digital rights management, such as technological protection measures that June has uh, pointed out. If we pick principles of this nature, and apply them within our domestic setting. Currently, of course, Uganda is amending its corporate laws or reforming its corporate laws and has touched on technological protection measures. Then that's helpful in embracing the position that is highlighted within the WIPO Performance and Phonograms Treaty. However, there are so many other challenges that keep coming out. When you open one door, you still see challenges along the way. So first of all, we have to understand what are the practicalities of that national treatment that we talk about. And uh, it's there under Article 3 of the TRIPS Agreement, and it's also reflected under Article 4 of the White Power Performance and Phonograms Treaty. If you are saying that you want to have a country that is a contracting state, ensuring that another contracting state is also going to protect more like a reciprocal arrangement of protection that my uh, producers and phonogram, producers of phonograms as well as performers in Uganda would have an equal measure of protection in another country. This becomes difficult where we don't have so many countries that have ratified the wipe of performance and phonograms treaty. And I want to focus more on the East African setting, for instance, as we keep increasing the membership of the East African community and seeing how we can embrace this, for instance, from uh, a perspective of the Africa Regional Intellectual Property Organization, which brings together the English speaking member states in their IP protection, the best way we can enjoy the benefits of the WPPT is to ensure that we're all signatories to the WPPT. So it wouldn't help as the ESC if it's only a few of the countries that are signatories. So Uganda has ratified it, with Kenya having signed in, in uh, back in 1996, Kenya, Kenya as, far, as far as the 2010 constitution of Kenya changed from a dualist to a monist nation in the sense that it now has to domesticate the international instruments that it has ratified. If it has not yet domesticated or it has not yet ratified, then this becomes a problem. And I'm not just speaking about Kenya, but all the other members of the ESC we can't fully enjoy the benefits of WPPT if we're not all contracting states. Secondly, the other challenge that would be important to think about is practicalizing the position or the principle of equitable remuneration, which is provided for under Article 15 of the WIPO Performance and Phonograms Treaty. So it's talking about performers and producers of phonograms ensuring that they receive equitable remuneration for their works. And this is an outcry, not just within the ESC, but globally, that many of these people are not paid sufficiently for their works. There's an imbalance in the payment, record producers, musicians, or even the people that take on their works, uh, uh, people in the companies, I'm going to be talking about, as you see in the slides, the issue related to coal ring back tunes that come from the works of songwriters and, and uh, performers. But how do we ensure that we have legislation that provides for equitable remuneration? Some countries have provided for it, but what is the practicality of this without overstepping the position of freedom to contract? That if you have two adult parties that are sitting at a round table and decide to enter into a contract, are you going to legislate as to how they contract? I'm, say, I'm not saying it's not possible, but practicalizing it is something that we have to think about and it becomes quite a challenge along the way. Then the third challenge we have is that of the three-step test that the junior has also talked about. So under Article 9 of the Bank Convention, and then also reflected under Article 13 of the TRIPS Agreement and onwards, in, um, as we see within different domestic legislations, the three-step test is all about step one, that you have special cases. 
Step two, you're looking at cases that do not conflict with the normal exploitation of work. And step three, you're looking at cases that are not prejudicial to the legitimate interests of the rights holder. So special cases can be anything. And looking at something that's not conflicting with the legitimate use of the work or even conflicting with normal exploitation of the work by the legitimate user is something that you'd have to point out as a defense that, look, I'm using your work here, but I'm not stepping into your commercial interest in your work. Um, the parties that fall in this bracket may be researchers, academicians, or anyone that's using your work for private use, but not for a commercial gain, or is not taking away the commercial benefits that would come to you. So the three-step test really becomes confusing. Section 15 of the Ugandan Corporate and Neighboring Rights Act talks about generally provides for fair use, fair use, and it somewhat incorporates the, the three-step test. But we've had case law that does not bring out a thorough appreciation of this section 15, and therefore showing that this, the market base, um, the judicial position itself has not given itself a thorough appreciation of what the three-step test is all about. The other challenge that I can allude to is what are the parameters of digital rights management? And in digital rights management, it's looking at uh, technological protection measures, for instance. Are we looking at encryption alone, uh, providing passwords alone, or does it go as far as the big call that's coming out from many of our content creators for that controversial private copy levy? And what the private copy levy is looking at is if someone is importing computers or any electronic gadget that can be used for copying material or downloading material, that gadget or electronic gadget has to be subject to a tax. And that tax is going to be given or passed on to the collecting societies or collective management organizations, which will then pass this on to their members so that they can feel that at least if someone is going to go ahead and copy their music or copy their productions or even their books, they will be receiving a remuneration through the private copy levy. But where does this leave, again, limitations and exceptions within the three-step test? For instance, again, with the example given of researchers or academicians, they'll all be caught within the bandwagon of having to pay for something where they're not likely to actually be infringing in your ownership of that work. So understanding these parameters becomes quite confusing and difficult, and therefore implementing this domestically is also very difficult. So by way of conclusion, just as a summary, I would just say that the growth of the digital space requires expedited implementation of the principles of the WIPO performance and phonograms treaty because definitely we're now more into a digital age and we need to see how we domesticate these principles within our domestic laws. However, awareness of these principles, interpreting these principles and practicalizing them is still a huge problem and therefore we have to go into advocacy and information dissemination. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much, Dr. Kakuza. The fact that you are a teacher of the law <laughs> comes out very clearly. Um, because, I mean, I also had my notes. I was taking notes as you take us through. Uh, what a wonderful way to follow up um, June's introduction. Um, and thank you for your insightful presentation on the legal framework. And, and, and thank you for um, infusing or introducing the the, the, the WPPT um, and the challenges in the present day environment um, and pointing out the emerging issues, um, you know, and infusing that with the current ecosystem, how those two are fusing together. That was um, very interesting. And obviously your experience and expertise in this field um, has really provided, provided us with valuable insights into the challenges faced um, by the creative industry, uh, both in Uganda. And, you know, I liked how you also addressed the general um, East African um, environment, because I believe um, most of, of, of the East African nations also have the shared um, challenges 
And thank you for that um, um, contribution. And obviously your contribution has set a very high bar <laughs> following June's, uh, which also set a very high bar for the rest of our speakers. And uh, we're grateful for your time and effort. And we obviously look forward to the Q&A session and to see what our participants today uh, what else they'd like to learn from you. Obviously, if we had more time, we'd have asked you to go a bit deeper, but hopefully what you haven't addressed um, and the speakers looked forward to hear, hopefully that they'll address that in the Q&A section. Um, so, Pius, over to you. Uh, could you discuss the current legal framework in Rwanda for protection of performance and producers and I'd say the challenges faced by the creative industry in implementing the treaty in Rwanda. Yes, uh, thank you so much, Catherine. Uh, I don't think you are fair uh, setting me to follow uh, uh, Dr. Kakoza and of course June. It was quite an interesting pre presentation and I hope um, listeners uh, have enjoyed it. I'll, uh, I'll briefly talk about uh, Rwanda's case and then probably leave uh, some time for the, for the great brains again to respond to uh, any queries. Yeah, so unfortunately in uh, Rwanda's case, we've not, um, we've not yet uh, ratified uh, the WPPT. Um, what we understand from the ministries, uh, it's in the works. Of course, this will be done following uh, the current, uh, the revision, the undergoing uh, revision of the current intellectual property law in Rwanda. Um, uh, but um, uh, the legal framework that we have currently in Rwanda, of course, of course, uh, Rwanda is uh, is uh, is a uh, is a member of uh, WIPO, and of course, uh, we've also acceded to the to the Ban Convention. Uh, but majorly, we we rely mostly on uh, on the intellectual property law in Rwanda. So the the as I've heard, I think in Kenya and Uganda they have uh, separate legislations governing, uh, I think, industrial property separately and, uh, uh, of course, copyrights. But in Rwanda, we have one uh, 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 piece of legislation uh, governing uh, intellectual property. We, we, we copyrights, but this was amended uh, following the the intellectual property policy of 2009. Uh, we ended up, uh, we got the law, uh, law number 31 uh, of uh, 26 uh, October 2009 on the protection of intellectual property. As you understand, um, we the protection of intellectual property um, in general is um, is a bit uh, something new and hence I think the, the, the shortfalls within the system. Um, but uh, this law, the, the, the current law of uh, 2009, which is being revised, um, is uh, has a particular section on the protection of, uh, performer, of performers and producers of phonograms and uh, of course, broadcasting organizations. And um, I think uh, majorly what is provided is uh, the same that is provided uh, in the WPPT, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, the broadcast, the, uh, the commercial right and the model rights, uh, rights of uh, broadcasting, fixation of, uh, of performance, uh, and of course, communication to, to the public. But it also has uh, it, it has a limitation. Uh, it gives limitations of uh, performances, um, and also uh, the related rights to that. Uh, the, there's there's limitation. There's 
a limitation on the use, but also provides free, uh, free use of related rights. And uh, free use is uh, for personal reasons. Uh, you can get free use, of course, when you're reporting on, on, on the events. And also you have free use on uh, for scientific purposes. I think what Dr. Kakosa was saying in terms of uh, research, um, so there's uh, free use for anyone in that respect. So um, we also have uh, a law uh, on the the revised uh, an amendment on the law of two thousand nine. Uh, there's an amendment of two thousand eighteen, but this one uh, majorly brings in the penalties or offenses uh, in terms of. Um, when there's forgery. Uh, I should also note that, uh, as I said, the law is currently being uh, revised. Uh, uh, there's a bill uh, under parliament now uh, considering um, the intellectual property policy of 2018. Uh, of course, bringing uh, the law up to speed with uh, what is happening uh, and uh, uh, in the case of Rwanda, the the the, the challenges as uh, the the challenges being faced uh, faced by the creative industry in general. Uh, of course, uh, the 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 biggest challenge is uh, is uh, concerns awareness. I, I don't think uh, most of the performers of uh, phonograms or even artists in general are aware of the protection granted under the intellectual property of 2009. So of course you can't claim your rights if, if you're not even aware of, of, um, of the safeguards that, uh, that you enjoy or that you have. Um, the, the, the other challenge, uh, uh, I think what we've had in uh, neighboring countries, uh, they have uh, strong uh, uh, collective management organizations, which is uh, different from what we have in Rwanda. We only have a private entity that is uh, that is um, that has a few members, and the uh, and the way they collect uh, royalties is and the distribution is not really is not properly done. Uh, the other challenge, of course, is um, for, for the creators and performers mostly, um, it's uh, when it's, for example, broadcasters, when they're doing that, it, it's in a way uh, promoting what the artists are doing, uh, in the end, cheating them. So I think until uh, now that the law is being revised will have a proper uh, CMO. And I think once that is in place, uh, uh, the rights of performers will take it over. Under the, the current law, one thing I didn't discuss is uh, we, 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 there's a provision for equitable um, uh, sharing. Uh, uh, it gives 50-50 uh, Basically, the performers uh, the performers have a fifty percent by the income that is generated, and uh, and the producer also has a fifty percent. But as uh, the previous speaker said, um, enforcement of this is quite challenging. So, in a way, I think even if we we uh, acceded or we became signatories to the WPBT. I don't think it would be useful if we don't have a proper mechanism or structures of enforcement. And the other issue concerning enforcement, we could have uh, or we can have proper provisions in the law, but the enforcement agencies are not giving the, for example, if it's a, if it's a case of forgery, how do government entities respond to that? Do they give it the right value? Um, do they even understand it properly that uh, this is uh, um, forgery and can we take it? 
if it was also law. Um, let's talk about the damages that are awarded uh, by the courts of law in case of infringement. Uh, so if, if um, the damages that are awarded are not worth uh, the investment that you put in, then it's a challenge to the, to the creative industry in general. Uh, the other challenge is, of course, um, the, the organization, I talked about the uh, collective management organizations, but also uh, um, the organizations, the arrangements for, uh, for that is not backed by government, but uh, internal arrangements between uh, producers and performers. How is it done? Do they trust one another? Do they work as a team? Do they, do they approach these issues um, as, um, as a group or each individual uh, fights on their own? I think uh, we, 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 we have one federation under the Ministry of Culture, uh, but this is mostly for awareness. And I don't think all the members are of that. Yeah, so uh, briefly, that's all I could say. Uh, hoping we will also uh, sign up to the WPPT in the future. Thank you so much. Wow, thank you so much, uh, Pius. Um, I don't know why you expressed <laughs> what you said at the beginning because that was very insightful. Um, and 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 it was very educational as well. I think um, I speak on behalf of the audience to say that uh, we've learned a lot. And I like how you've covered um, the broad overview, looking into the subject, how you've covered the role of, um, you've looked at it end to end and looked at the challenges towards implementation. And I like how you've highlighted things like um, the role that all stakeholders have to play, for instance, um, enforcement, um, the need for awareness, creating awareness. Um, so that was very um, insightful. And even um, I like how you've covered the steps that need to be taken uh, by Rwanda to address the challenges faced by the industry. And that was both informative and also thought. to the Q&A session where you can probably um, give more insights um, to our listeners today who want to know additional things about Rwanda. So um, finally, uh, Judith, could you please um, discuss the current legal framework in Tanzania for the protection of performance and producers and um, hopefully take us through the challenges faced by the creative industry in implementing the treaty. Hello, Catherine. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Okay. Hello and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. And uh, um, as Catherine mentioned, um, it's a good audience, and uh, I'm happy to have uh, um, my lecturer, uh, Dr. Kakulva, here. Uh, so far, what uh, um, I would like to discuss on it's uh, um, uh, I'll go straight here on the uh, uh, current 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 law that we have, but uh, um, bear with me that everything has been uh, uh, mentioned here, uh, but uh, uh, as we know. Uh, Tanzania, when it comes to Tanzania in terms of IP, we're exceptional <laughs> because we have uh, two regimes that operate in Tanzania in relation to um, in relation to to IP. Uh, bear with me as I share my slides with you. Um, uh, uh, I'll go straight to speak a little bit about uh, our IP regime in Tanzania, where we have uh, uh, the one which operates in mainland, Tanzania mainland, and the one which operates in Zanzibar. Uh, 
And this uh, has gone uh, uh, through uh, what I can say. It's a it's a it's a, a constitution matter. Uh, it has uh, happened so as um, uh, it has happened so uh, as given by our our constitution. Uh, so we have an union matters and non union matters. Well, in the constitution, one of the steps that uh, um, have been uh, uh, mentioned is it's it's uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's IP to be non union. Uh, another thing, uh, so I'll speak uh, on the current uh, current uh, uh, legal framework that we have in terms in relation to to protection of our performers and uh, um, producers uh, uh, of photographs. Um, and uh, we have uh, recently um, two uh, we have uh, two separate uh, laws which are under copyright uh, law. And uh, we have the one that operates in Zanzibar and the one that operates in, in, in Tanzania mainland. And uh, we have also offices. These laws are uh, uh, introduced two offices that operates uh, uh, and administer, uh, admin, uh, administer uh, copyright and related rights issues uh, uh, in uh, in Zanzibar and uh, in Tanzania mainland. And uh, uh, when you look at it, uh, um, they are both have uh, uh, this, I can say, uh, similar and uh, uh, similar functions when you look at it. And uh, um, at the same time, they also uh, deal with the uh, um, uh, more disciplinary uh, functions. I always call them as two heads, uh, uh, um, Functions uh, because uh, they exist as like for uh, they, they exist as a, a, a copyright office at the same time collective management organizations. I believe uh, June speak a little bit about that. Um, uh, spoke about that, um, but uh, recently we have also some uh, uh, progresses where um, uh, in July 2022 last year. Um, uh, uh, Tanza, uh, in July 2022, COSOTA uh, ceased to be uh, a, uh, to administer uh, a role of uh, a CMO uh, called as a collective management organization that uh, um, with the uh, finalization of regulations which are to be uh, coming very recently, I think uh, in months time or two months time, we are going to have those licenses, that those regulations where uh, uh, now uh, associations of the authors and creators will be uh, having that role. And uh, this uh, uh, has taken a, a, a good progress. And uh, uh, we have learned uh, from uh, Kenya uh, and uh, other, uh, uh, other countries that uh, have done that. So uh, briefly, our functions uh, uh, at the Copyright Office, as when I speak about our functions, I mean in Tanzania in relation to Copyright Offices. And uh, my um, uh, 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 presentations will look uh, uh, much on the mainland, uh, uh, but uh, the functions are all of the, the same. And, uh, uh, one of the key uh, uh, function which relates to um, the treaty, WPPT, is that uh, uh, to register the works uh, of the members uh, of, the, of the creators, including performers and their performances and producers in their produ productions. Uh, uh, that means that uh, uh, it cut across uh, uh, what I call the major and key function of the WPPT to look on the performance and uh, producers of work and also including uh, uh, broadcasting organizations as the producers of work. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, uh, the law in mainland and Zanzibar is uh, mutatis mutandis. Uh, it's all, all, all of, almost uh, we are of the same uh, functions and uh, uh, 
I picked up some on, the, I came across some of the uh, uh, provisions which uh, uh, in uh, corporate laws, which uh, um, looked upon and, and, uh, and I gave out uh, um, the credibility of the performers uh, uh, producers uh, of phonographs and uh, broadcasting organizations. And when you look at the law, and here I'm talking about uh, 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 Copyright uh, and Neighboring uh, Rights uh, uh, Act of 1989 of Tanzania mainland, uh, you check, you'll see that uh, one of the objectives of the act is to protect lawful interests of performing artists, producers of phonographs and broadcasting organizations. Uh, in relating to their productions and uh, by granting them their related rights. As uh, our previous speakers have mentioned, that uh, these laws uh, have been there, uh, these uh, provisions have been there in, in, in our copyright laws uh, for, for some time. But now when you look at it uh, with the progress that we are going, uh, our world is moving on, uh, the innovation world uh, and, uh, and uh, the creativity, which is every day uh, progressing. Is it uh, uh, really sufficient? Uh, are these provisions that are, uh, were, for, uh, were, were formed uh, 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 years back, decades, are they sufficient? So that's the key, uh, a key thing that uh, we, sh we, 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 we are to focus on and uh, to see how the, the, uh, the new uh, creativity, uh, which is brought into the uh, copyright world, which is still, most of it deals with, uh, with the creative industries. Uh, uh, is it uh, sufficient? Will it be, uh, Doable and uh, will the local content, what we have, will be measured that well when it comes to the performing artists and uh, producing of our um, of, our, of our, our our uh our songs, uh, uh the 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 beats and all that, and even our local broadcasting organizations. Uh, uh, what uh, what else uh, I've, I've, uh, I've come across our law is that uh, uh, people can really need to, uh, more and to see how uh, it has captured when it comes to broadcasting and the, the act that uh, uh, or that uh, um, performers can authorize uh, other people or third parties in terms of uh, of, of, of commercial uh, commercial aspect. Uh, now I'll just come and uh, talk about the status in terms of Tanzania. Uh, we are a WIPO member uh, and uh, we have a, a number of, uh, of uh, treaties that we have to ratify. But uh, uh, so far, Tanzania has not ratified uh, the uh, WPPT and the WIPO copyright treaty. We call them internet treaties, digital uh, avenue treaties international, uh, as a, uh, we, we, we were given the introduction. Uh, and uh, so far, I've uh, 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 been, uh, been notified that uh, uh, these uh, um, submissions have already been taken to the uh, responsible ministry, and uh, uh, we believe uh, they will be considered, and uh, Tanzania will ratify the, uh, these uh, uh, these two treaties, which are very important, especially in our current situation now of digital environment. So the challenges, what I will say, is they are not that I can say uh, different from other East Africa uh, countries that what has been shared before. Um, what uh, I, I, I know is that uh, the digital and the uh, uh, new advanced era that is going on, especially in the uh, uh, copyright aspect, is so challenging. So these new uh, laws, uh, we believe that uh, uh, when they uh, they are. Um, they are implemented on the output, they are bended into national 
laws, they will capture that. So it is believed that uh, uh, that one of the challenges that uh, we have to be very careful about and that uh, we will look on it and uh, we are going to we are going to uh, to dwell when well in 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 uh, in uh, um, amending our laws or introducing new laws, the local laws that will capture that uh, um, uh, will capture the needs of the uh, WIPO treaties uh, in in international as inter internet aspects. Also, I'll say the mindsets. Uh, as a uh, PUSA had mentioned, the awareness program, the physical online platform media, these have to uh, to come into uh, the creators themselves knowing that uh, how they can deal with this, but also our laws and our environment have to accept and uh, knowing that uh, um, such provisions will assist and I will also make it possible for our uh, creators and our local content, our uh, our creativity to be seen in that international aspect. So coordination of performers and producers, which is very difficult, uh, but uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, of such uh, uh, such uh, laws which will be introduced uh, locally, we believe that uh, they will be aware uh, of their returns and then uh, they will know that uh, they have to do properly uh, work on the on their creativity in, in relation to to the laws that will be there. We have come across a lot of disputes. Uh, I know there are a lot of disputes, especially uh, uh, in copyright. Um, uh, uh, regime uh, where uh, most of them have been not that uh, not that aligned in in our uh, our, our, our courts, I can say, but uh, also uh, the use of uh, um, uh, dispute alternative dispute resolution aspect in a way that uh, um, out there uh, copyright matters are very very, 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 uh, I can say expensive, uh, expensive as ex expensive cases. So um, when it comes to disputes, it brings us back to uh, people to, to create us to know that uh, they have to be well informed in terms of uh, doing well their uh, creativity, but putting properly their, uh, their documents, their agreements, so that they won't lead to any disputes. Um, uh, lastly, uh, uh, also I'll say, as I uh, uh, mentioned earlier, non-implementation of uh, all the provisions that uh, we are need to cooperate into our laws. This uh, make, uh, makes also uh, difficult for the right holders to go ahead and uh, uh, using these laws that uh, we have. And uh, when it comes to that, that's when we'll go back to issues of uh, uh, disputes and uh, which will lead to piracy also. So I believe amendments of these regulations and uh, introducing these in, in, uh, um, laws into our into our 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 laws into into our countries and uh, looking at the big picture of East Africa community, it will really enable creativity and the performance will be seen uh, and uh, I'll say will be respected. Uh, not rather the way it is now, they have been looked at the backbenchers. So backbenchers are always good because they're the ones who bring about the rhythm of that content well. So I'll end up there for now. And uh, in case of anything, in case of any questions and the insights, I'll be glad to be sharing. Thank you. Oh, wow. Thank you so much, Judith. Um, would like to say a heartfelt thank you for your fantastic presentation on the uh, legal framework for protecting performers and producers in Tanzania. I think we've learned um, a lot. Um, <clears throat> there are some key takeaways, and um, I think we've also learned a lot about the current ecosystem as it is in Tanzania and the current environment. And um, from your presentation, actually what you've highlighted there seems to be very 
common challenges shared by all um, East, East African uh, countries, or rather by most East African countries, um, and um, your insights into the role of, you know, international organizations in supporting Tanzania's creative industry uh, were particularly enlightening. And uh, we really appreciate the unique, the unique perspective that you brought to this topic, and obviously your passion and dedication to protecting um, the rights of performers and pro producers hasn't gone unnoticed. And um, we're grateful for your participation today. So, and it was quite interesting to learn that uh, Dr. Kakuza was your lecturer. <laughs> so that was interesting. And um, <clears throat> I think um, uh, you are our last speaker and I'd like to really thank all the speakers for their valuable insights. And we now come to the exciting part, which um, we now open the floor for a more extensive Q&A session. Um, and um, if anyone has a specific question for a particular speaker, please indicate in, in your question. I can see that our Q&A uh, section is quite busy. And I'm going to highlight some of the questions and where the question is addressed to a specific Panelists, I'm going to highlight that. So, um, for instance, we have uh, Charlotte Nyangeri who has uh, raised the question How do you ensure that moral rights are upheld under WPPT, if included, and the national law, seeing as we have had controversial works from performers such as the boycott of Diamond Platinum songs by the late President John from the Magufuli. Oh, that's an interesting question. So um, maybe I'd like to pose this uh, question to Judith, <laughs> since you're from Tanzania. So would you like to address that question? Judith, are you available to take that question? Yes, and I am. Uh, I am reading it now. Uh, so, how do you ensure that moral rights are upheld? Um, okay. Okay. Uh, am I audible? Right. Yes. Uh, what I would say is that uh, as uh, moral rights are concerned. Um, uh, when it comes to copyright, we have to mostly not look on the economic rights only, but also it goes across the uh, moral rights. Uh, uh, and uh, once uh, that aspect also is uh, being brought up, uh, uh, with the uh, with the introduction of these treaties, I believe our national law uh, we we will we, we'll, we'll have to what I can say will have to be in line with the uh, uh, the works of this performance, and uh, uh, I wouldn't say much about uh, uh, diamond platinum songs. Uh, but uh, what I'll say is that uh, the law itself uh, speak about moral rights, that mm -hmm. they won't be as astonished, they won't be changed, uh, and they'll be respected in terms of the, of the uh, other laws which are of the national. So maybe if I'll drill more on the, on the, on the works uh, uh, that uh, um, the performers of the, of these artists that have done so far, and uh, I'll give uh, more uh, in detail the, uh, of this uh, of this question. Oh, thank you for that, Judith. Um, that was quite interesting, um, Dr. Kakuza. Given that having had the panelists, and um, I think each panelist having uh, presented on the broad overview of their, you know, what is there in their jurisdictions as well as the challenges that seem to be common. Um, looking at it from a regional block perspective, you know, there's the EAC, there's SADC, there's AFTER. How, how can we leverage on, say, these regional blocks to counter these challenges from a 
you know, regional perspective as opposed to how we are dealing with them right now in silos. You know, you hear this is what Tanzania is doing, this is what Uganda is doing, this is what Kenya is doing, but really it's the same effort, same challenges. Can we leverage on regional blocks or regional organizations to um, counter these challenges? I don't know what your thoughts are. So for starters, there's no way we can jump the domestic and, and uh, leverage from the regional. Um, because intellectual property is territorial in nature, but you always have to start with the domestic legislation and see what it says before you try to tap into whatever advantages there may be with the regional. So nonetheless, that being said, the, the efforts that are currently being worked upon on the regional level is through ARIPO, the Africa Regional Intellectual Property Organization. So this brings together the English speaking uh, African member states on emergence of their intellectual property matters. And as of August of 2021, Aripo came up with the Kampala Protocol on Voluntary Registration of Copyright. Mm -hmm. That protocol was signed by quite a number of states, including Uganda. It was hosted within Uganda. So what they're working on now is the regulations that will help with implementation of that protocol. It's a bit of a slow process, but hopefully headed in the right direction. But the key word that you have to pick out of that is that it provides for voluntary registration because we all know that corporate protection has no formalities. So starting with the domestic level, there are no formalities here, then we have to see what the domestic positions say about how to protect uh, producers and performers and all those others before you can think of how to tap into that Kampala protocol at a regional level. And that's as far as it goes. I don't know if oh, that wow. answers. I mean, yes, yes, definitely. Um, I mean, that's quite thought provoking if, if 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 you think about it. Yeah. So that's a really good answer. Um, and and before before you go, I know there had been a question. Um, that I see you've answered, but I'd still like to pose it to you, and then you so that everybody can get to hear. It's quite interesting. So, um, an attendee asked. How can performers and producers' rights be protected on social media platforms such as TikTok and Instagram? And maybe, Dr. Kakuza, you can take us through uh, what 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 you responded on that. So people always asked about how copyright runs in the social media platforms. Um, we we have to appreciate not just not just the corporate principles but cyber law principles and the demands that come with either computer law, you want to call it cyber law. So when someone is downloading an app, an Instagram app or a TikTok app, they're what they call the click wrap agreements that people do not give consideration about because they just want to quickly scroll through and click yes and then download without reading what the click wrap agreement says. But some of the stipulations within this agreement, actually the whole agreement is contractual. It's basically telling you in most respects that you, you're going to be allowing to give away your contacts. You're going to be allowing to give away certain rights, etc., etc. And then you click agree without knowing it and then you download the app. But TikTok in particular has an arrangement with the copyright owners, the people whose content we all lip sync, especially music through TikTok. They allow for TikTok to use their corporate works and in exchange it's more like marketing themselves and many of them have gone on to get lucrative music deals by virtue of their work being exposed through TikTok. Mm -hmm. So the arrangements are kind of changing in the direction it's just something that was stable at some point that TikTok would think about some uh, commercial remuneration think about a deeper economic rights for such persons but mm -hmm. As I know, in the past, it has really been about just marketing. That is okay. The license arrangement they have is to allow TikTok to upload their music and then people to lip sync this music without any of the owners of this music coming out and saying that there's been an infringement of sorts. But as we know, TikTok is being uh, pushed against the wall in many developed countries uh, with the position being that the, the app allows for surveillance. So we don't know how far that will go. <laughs> That's where it lies. The our question was about TikTok and Instagram. So with Instagram, I would generally say one who feels that his corporate has been infringed through Instagram 
we would follow the normal route for corporate infringement without necessarily thinking that what does the WPPT say about this, but we'll just say that someone is using my work, which I posted on Instagram, so you can sue for that, uh, claiming economic rights infringement and more rights. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. <laughs> that is so insightful. Um, then I think okay. the... Sorry, I just wanted to add a different uh, uh, angle. I totally agree with Dr. Mm -hmm. Akaka. Is that okay? Um, I'll, I'll use one of the examples that we had in Kenya not too long ago during our elections. And I think, so every time we see music on, uh, on social media platforms, there's definitely the, the example that, uh, and the reality that Dr. Kakuza has explained where you can pre-license, almost whitelist the use of the content so that there's no infringement per se. But then there's also content that is pre-packaged so, for example, we take a video right now at a, at a campaign for a political party, and then the person who was instructed to take that video edits the video using one of my songs and then uploads it on a social media platform. So we may not know, uh, if we're not very well versed with the platforms, if this was a pre-packaged uh, piece of content or if it was just me with my phone and then using one of the drop-down menu songs that exists mm -hmm. in, the, in the TikTok or in the, in the Instagram uh, music library. So those are two separate uh, scenarios. And in the second one that I've just shared, we had one of our boy bands, Saudi Souls, music was actually used by one of the political parties last year when we were going to our elections. And it was the photographer, videographer person who was hired, took the content, edited a reel, chose their song, put it on the bottom of the, synced the audio to the, to the visuals, and then uploaded it on on uh, social media. So just to bear, just to uh, explain that there is a distinction between those two uses, just to add on to what Dr. Mm -hmm. Kakusa said, that scenario, they went ahead and asked for the content to be taken down. I don't remember if there was any compensation, but that's still the same platform, but a different way of accessing uh, the content. Oh, yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah, I remember seeing that demand letter. And June, June don't disappear because I have the next question is still yours. Um, so then speaking of um, emerging issues, I mean, in the context of we're in the digital age and um, and then there's always this assertion that, you know, that the, the law kind of like drugs behind or regulation drugs behind and, and, and it's usually rarely ever catches up with say innovation or you know so then there's what would call the emerging emerging issues that would be there generally having heard what the speakers from the other countries um highlighted on what's going on um in their countries which basically has given us and what we call an east african overview what would you say are the emerging issues that if you are sitting and you are saying you know i would recommend this is what i've highlighted as the law needs to do this in order to catch up so that um, the aims of WPPT are still, you know, uh, they're still able to achieve what WPPT aims to achieve. Just mm -hmm. a few. What would you highlight? What's your takeaway? Um, I think the, the, the biggest problem, Catherine, that I, I think in my few years, uh, almost under dec uh, two decades, um, have observed is the the need for those in the creative industry to be a part and parcel of these conversations. So mm -hmm. uh, every time that laws and policies first and then laws are being uh, uh, developed, if we are not at the table, um, then it becomes very, very difficult to, to be able to say what it is your pain point is. Um, and then it becomes a, a group of policymakers and a group of legislators who determine what might be the reality for those on the ground. And I think every time I, I have an opportunity to speak at, at, at uh, forums like this, if there's even an advocate who has clients who are creative industry players, the first thing is tell them to participate when there are calls for public participation. Um, when you start to experience something, and I think Dr. Kakuza has alluded to this, even just how the, the younger generation are creating content right now. He spoke about COVID and a lot of the collaborations that happened across borders. We couldn't travel, but we could all get online and do a studio session with somebody in the US, somebody in Uganda, somebody in South Africa. So already 
the law had not necessarily foreseen those types of scenarios, but here we are, technology en enabled us to do this kind of thing through Zoom, through different platforms. Um, and then collaborations were done at a much faster pace uh, mm -hmm. without clicking I accept because nobody was sharing contracts. We were all just, let's keep creating. And when the creative juices are flowing, that's, that's a great thing, but it's also problematic because we think about the administrative aspects much, much later. So any collaboration that was, was uh, realized during COVID, how do you register the song? How do you make sure that your, your uh, split sheet has the correct information? Who is the author? Who is the composer? Who is the arranger? Some territories require for you to say where the sound recording uh, nationality is. And then the Copyright Act in Kenya would require you to put that down when you're registering the work. So I'm using that example to say that the people who are directly involved in the day-to-day -day creative industry uh, activities must be at the table. It can't just be us lawyers uh, talking and saying, okay, the treaty provided this, but the treaties also came up because there was agitation. There was some activism by the producers, by the performers, um, and it hasn't stopped. So I would say definitely having a collective uh, position um, in East Africa is important because a lot more collaboration has been achieved already. Um, and we do want to have the benefits of the WPPT. But um, I also think being able to be solid in our position and not be influenced by, let's say, the West, I think is important. And the reason I'm saying that is we've recently been having our discussions on um, the FTA, the free trade agreements. Mm -hmm. And if you look at some of the, the feedback from the US side, um, you, you, we, I don't know that as Kenya or as Uganda or as Rwanda, Tanzania, we agree with the US position on some of these things. Yet we, in 1996, maybe we did because we are now 27 years later. So if we talk about emerging issues, we must follow what is actually happening presently on the ground. Uh, one of the biggest uh, issues that has been raised in these discussions, and it is an emerging issue in my mind, is that in the US, the music industry setup is very different from ours here in East Africa. Mm -hmm. they, we don't have major record labels like Sony and Universal and you know uh, EMI, the way they used to. We have a lot more independent music labels. And so that means a few smaller uh, groups of people set up their industry. You have Wasafi in, in Tanzania. We have, you know, we used to have people like Ogopa DJs. We have people like, uh, uh, you know, Clemo. So our industry scale is very different and a lot more people are producing content for themselves. Now, they're bringing in an argument that the equitable right of remuneration that we have discussed and is in the WPPT should not be the case. It should not be provided in our respective uh, acts because it should be an exclusive right for the owners of phonogram producers. Now, that's a very interesting reality. Why are they saying that? As universal, they are well known, they have financial muscle, they can hire the big gun lawyers, but how many of the record labels in Africa can say that? That they have millions and millions of dollars to spend years in court as opposed to just making music. So if it means that each of our laws provide that the CMOs can go to a media house, can go to a bar, can go to a restaurant and use the equitable right of remuneration to collect a portion, an equitable fair pay for the producer, for the performer, then why shouldn't that be the case? Because if we convert it back to an exclusive right and only an exclusive right, we may have denied the performers and the producers that uh, commercial income. So I think really for me, the emerging issues digitally, I think we've addressed that. We are seeing a lot more uh, platforms and I completely agree with Dr. Kakuza. I always ask in my seminars, how many of you read <laughs> the terms and conditions? The truth is we want to be on Instagram. We want to be on Twitter. We want to be on TikTok because it's fun, uh, but we don't really want to read how much of our data we've given away. We don't want to read the conditions because that's just how the human being who is not a lawyer behaves. But because 
of the onset of many, many digital platforms, it has become a friend and a foe. And we have to acknowledge that. I don't think that's a bad thing. I just think that we have to be realistic and that sometimes we shouldn't be too rigid where the law is concerned. If we loosen some of the provisions and say, do we want more collaboration? The answer is yes. Why am I saying yes with that much confidence? It's what the industry has already begun to do, even when we have not yet ratified the treaties. They are already moving. They're not waiting for us. So if I observe what I'm seeing in the various countries, in Rwanda, the music industry in Rwanda, in Tanzania, in Uganda, and in Kenya, our, our industry players are not waiting for the treaty. They are moving. So now that mm -hmm. we are 27 years old, shouldn't we be asking ourselves, what is the current snapshot of what is the reality today and how much of these provisions are still relevant? And maybe as an East African bloc, through ARIPO or at WIPO, we should be agitating for a more relevant, a more timely, and a more present 21st century rendition of, of what the, the provisions of WPPT would be. That would be my, my submission. Oh, wow. That's very interesting. So let's tailor make, um, even if we're adopting whatever we're adopting, let's tailor make it to fit our environment and to fit um, the current environment as it is yeah. and to match yes. or to leverage on um the current efficiencies that are already there so it should be as practical as possible oh that's quite interesting and building onto that for pills um, um so uh, belmont durandal asked a question and he said doesn't the non-signature or non-ratification of wppt by several east african states we can, to some extent, the protection of uh, performance and phonograms producers rights at the regional level of East Africa. Or, there or would there be an East Africa regional instruments capable of remedying this? This insofar as certain panelists pointed out on certain um, insufficiencies of the national laws. So Phil, what are your thoughts on that? Um, and, and and because I also and I'm posing this question to you because I also remember when you were pointing up um, you you pointed out and I think June also touched on this issue um, of you know you pointed out the issue of creating awareness that it's a challenge in Rwanda uh, creation of awareness and June pointed out the issue of stakeholder um, engagement so I'd like you to wrap that around also the fact that um, our different nations, there are several nations that haven't uh, um, ratified WPPP or haven't yet signed or deposited the instrument. How does that, what are your thoughts on how that weakens to some extent the rights of performers? Thoughts on that? Sorry, um, yes, um, thank you for that. Uh, I think, it is a, a challenge um, if we haven't ratified uh, the agreement. I think we are missing out on some uh, some important aspects that could be um, used by. Uh, let me talk about random by uh, random performers um, mm, producers. Yeah. But I personally uh, don't like. I think yes, we should do it, but I don't think it's the biggest problem we have. I think uh, until a point when we are ready to even exploit what we have in the current uh, legislation we have, then um, even the international best practices will also be a challenge or will also not be exploited. But I agree, uh, and I've seen Dr. Kakuza responded. I've seen, uh, I agree it's important that, uh, that we get that uh, and uh, we adopt, we ratify that. But I think much effort is needed even with the current uh, legal framework. That we have. Oh, that's, that's very interesting. Thank you for that, Pius. Um, now, because we are almost coming to the end, um, of our session. I'd like to invite all the speakers to give their um, last comment if there's anything that you did not um, touch on that you would like to. 
So uh, I would like to invite all our speakers to share their final thoughts and recommendations on the topic. Maybe we can begin with John. Two minutes each. Thank you. I was busy typing a response to Melanie, but with your permission, let me just address it here uh, as, I, as I give my final yeah. comments. Um, uh, Melanie has asked what, uh, you know, as a, as a performing artist, as a member of this creative industry, what are the major challenges? Um, and I think the biggest ones are being able to realize the economic, the exercising of our economic rights. What, why is that the case? In, in Kenya, for example, and I think um, uh, Judith alluded to this, you know, our CMOs, our collective management organizations are each set up to handle one class of rights. So MCSK would be for the authors and composers, the copyright owners. CAMP would be for the, the Kenya Association of Music Producers, for the owners of these phonogram uh, records we are speaking about. And then PRISC, which is the Performance Rights Society of Kenya. Now their mandate is to negotiate, collect, and distribute uh, from users of, of copyrighted and related right works. That means, you know, uh, radio stations, broadcast houses, TV stations, uh, bars, restaurants, public service vehicles, airlines, the list is endless. Now, the compliance has been a big, big problem, and it has been below 10% for a very long time. So a lot, of, a lot of the bigger hotel chains are paying, but the smaller ones are not. And why is that the case? The enforcement we spoke about that's in the WPPD, it says to each contracting state, ensure that you have a way for the owners of copyright and owners of the related rights to enforce their rights. Now, whether it's through a civil action or through a criminal action, as I mentioned, the provision must be there and then the enabling environment must be there. So in the, in the absence of that, if a CMO cannot go to a media house and say, pay me now or else, the media house says, or else what? Or else I'll take you to court. How much does that cost? And whose money are you using? You're using the royalty payments that are supposed to go back to the performer and the producer and the author and the composer. So I think that's one of the major issues. How do we get the ecosystem? Creating the body is great. We have the bodies. The bodies have been provided for in the act, but how do we enable them to actually carry out enforcement? Secondly, is an issue of quota. We are listening to so much international content that even after collecting, you find that 85% of the money you collect has to go back out again because of the national treatment and the reciprocal, reciprocal agreements that Dr. Kakuza so eloquently explained. So there are elements of the treaties that have been domesticated, even though Kenya has not ratified it yet and deposited the, the, the treaty, but we've taken those principles and put them in our act because we see the value in them. But the active processing requires the Copyright Office to be uh, not just armed with uh, the ability to bark, but armed with teeth to actually fight and have a, deep, uh, a deeply engaged and deeply funded uh, enforcement arm. So that if somebody uh, infringes on my rights, I can go to the Copyright Tribunal, I can go to the Kenya Copyright Board, and I can seek the help that I need because it is a specialized area of law. So I think for me, I think we, the engagements need to continue and I really want to applaud the East Africa Law Society for gathering all of us. Um, I'm really happy to have met my fellow colleagues and I hope we can continue engaging. Um, and I think at the end of the day, for all of you who are logged on, it's we keep reading, we keep educating ourselves tell your clients if they're in the creative industry to read up. It's not enough to just say, I'm a great singer. I'm a great movie maker. As a lawyer, I think we have a right and an obligation to continue to educate and pass on this message so that they know exactly what to advocate for when, it, when the time comes. So mine is really just to say thank you. Uh, and I hope we can continue engaging. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. Dr. Kakuta, two minutes. Yes, thank you, Catherine. Again, I also want to add my voice to thank the East African Law Society and our moderators for doing such an excellent job. In terms of my final wrap-up message, um, the law has always been playing catch-up with technological protection measures. I mean, the TPMs have been in place for over 20 years, and to an extent, they've been effective. Where we see grievances in the way the law is helping content owners in having their copyright protected efficiently through regulation. Let's, let's go back to self-regulation. Let's look at the 
the benefits that are there through self-regulation. And when I talk about self-regulation, I'm talking about digital rights management, or TPNs, and how effective those can be. Because to, to a better extent, these are doing a much better job than what the legislation is doing. So we may take forever to wait for ratification within the ESC of the WIPO Performance and Phonograms Treaty, as well as any other regulations that would come in place. But if we can't protect within our own technological measures, then those would be the best to think about right now. Thank you. Those are my party shots. Oh, wow. Thank you for that. Uh, Pius, your closing remarks? Two minutes. Yes. Um, uh, thank you, Catherine. I also want to thank uh, the East African Law Society and yourself, Catherine, for organizing this. I think it was quite uh, interesting and uh, we, we learned a lot. Um, I think for me, what I'll say is uh, within East Africa, uh, if I look at uh, a country like Kenya, I think they are way ahead of Rwanda in terms of protection or enforcement of protections granted. And, uh, and I think if we can work together as a region, uh, it, it will be helpful. Uh, I think I'm looking forward to inviting June uh, to Rwanda maybe she'll uh, teach a lesson to some of the artists here. So let's keep the collaborations working and we learn a lot. Thank you so much. Oh, thank and you for that, Pius. Very happy to come to you. Send me the invitation quickly. <laughs> I will. <laughs> All right, wonderful. Um, Judy, you're closing the box to the net. And while you're at it, Judy, I know you wanted to address a, a question. Was by Nyanusi. Uh, you want to? Yes, I, I, hello, can you hear me? Yeah, I'm audible. Yes, uh, I already mentioned, I already answered him, but uh, um, to make it further is that uh, um, he asked, like, uh, what yeah. should be, uh, what, should, what should be done? I think awareness and uh, um, to go on, uh, um, not only on, uh, on the, uh, for law uh, lawmakers and policy makers, but also the uh, relevant persons, the persons that uh, we are, uh, I, I can say we are working for or with. So to bring that inclusivity, that they be on board and looking on the on the changes. Because when you look at the law, uh, as I've said, most of our laws uh, had captured that uh, um, aspect of performance rights. But is that uh, because of being backbenchers, we or most of the musicians, let's say artists, uh, they only dealt with them as uh, giving them what they have and then that's it. But uh, when it comes to creativity, they didn't look at it in that aspect of uh, uh, a copyright. Mm -hmm. So um, to note that, uh, like uh, uh, other panelists have said, I thank uh, uh, EL, EL, EALF, uh, sorry, uh, uh, East African Law Society, um, yourself, and uh, um, to get me in this, and uh, uh, the call from uh, Copyright Society of Tanzania here, uh, um, and uh, um, uh, with the uh, advocate Sandy. Uh, what my take will be like, uh, uh, I would like to put a notion on two viewpoints, uh, one being, uh, uh, Changes are inevitable. So these laws, you see, they were 1996, and uh, now things have come that uh, we are changing. And uh, believe me, they will have to change again. Uh, uh, give ourselves five years uh, or 10 years, they'll change again. So what is our speed and what are we taking on board? As June mentioned, uh, that uh, also we have to look on our own local content. You can see like now we have a lot of local series, let's say. Uh, performers are doing local, uh, bringing local uh, content into that creativity. So we have to, 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 to help them, we have to talk to them, we have to bring these laws that are, uh, goes uh, well into our moral rights. And at the same time, uh, the performers and these who are doing this work, they get back their investment well. And second thing is that, uh, Copyright Society of Tanzania now in uh, Kosota goes on the new uh, new angle of having uh, 
corporate office uh, for themselves and the CMOs being left with the, um, with the authors, creators of work. So this means they have to learn a lot from Kenya. The beautiful things on those that are June has said, the uh, bad experience can be also positive or negative. So they have to, to, to be aware that uh, we are not isolated, that we are the only ones who are doing this. There are some countries that have done that before. So they should go on learning, relearning, and uh, equipping themselves with what is going to come ahead. And with that, those associations have to know that how they are going to be managed that they are being to be coordinated well, regulated, and they have to follow uh, what is there as a, it will be in the law and those provisions. I thank you so much and I thank you all the listeners. And uh, I've learned a lot from, um, from June, uh, from Pulse and uh, obviously from Dr. Anthony. And uh, I thank you all, you're all Karibu to Tanzania. Oh, thank you so much for that, Judith. Wow, what an incredible discussion we've had today. Um, the question, the chat section, I see the questions were many, but unfortunately our time is limited. And uh, I, I really thank our panelists for trying to answer most of those questions. Um, I would propose that maybe we have a, you know, a follow-up uh, webinar to just um, try and exhaust most of the issues um, that I have uh, come up today because I think it's safe to say that we've touched on them and there are some that uh, we would probably both the panelists and uh, the listeners would like to delve deeper in so feel free to give feedback to uh, ELS on uh, whether we should have a follow-up webinar and what issues we should specifically uh, look into but that was an incredible discussion. Um, I hope that everybody has enjoyed learning about performance rights and um, the white opportunity as much as I have. And uh, from the fantastic introduction we had to all our speakers, um, insightful presentations, I'm, for, I'm sure that we have all come away with a deeper understanding of this important topic. I would like to thank the East African Law Society um, I would like to thank um, the chair of our committee, Mr. Sunday Nabogoba. Um, I, I am the vice chair of um, the committee. My name is Catherine Kariuki and I practice with Triple OK Law Advocates. I am a TMT lawyer, which includes um, practicing in IP. And I would like to thank our panelists today from June, Dr. Kakuza, Pills, and Judith. Thank you so much. And now that we've learned all about the legal framework for protecting performers and producers, it's time for us to put our dancing shoes and celebrate. Let's all channel our inner performers and dance today like nobody's watching. Just make sure that your webcam is turned off first. In all seriousness, um, I would like to thank our fantastic speakers. Again, we cannot thank you enough for sharing your expertise with us today. Your insights have been invaluable and have sparked uh, important conversations that really um, provoked our thoughts, if not for anything else. And um, that will continue long after this webinar, I believe. To our audience, thank you so much for joining us and engaging um, in, you know, and, and your engaging questions. Thank you for staying, thank you for staying with us for um, the last two hours. And thank you for the very nice uh, Q&A session. So let's raise a glass to performance rights and why opportunity and to all those who work tirelessly to protect um, this important right. Uh, for those uh, who have called, most of our panelists have called, have done a call for action for all of us to go to our different jurisdictions and try and make a difference and try and create more awareness um, and even uh, be impactful in our practice. So thank you very much and have a good uh, evening. Um, and have a good day so you can exit as to your pleasure.